Hello everyone and welcome back to The Shed. Now, I thought today what, uh, what I would talk about is uh, amplification. And uh, for those of you that have watched uh, the video before about the National Panasonic Music Center um, and also reviewed a number of the products that we have for sale, is that I believe that amplifiers are at the heart of everyone's system. Now, back in the day, in the 70s and 80s, it was always said that input devices were the articles uh, within a hi-fi that you should spend much more money on, i.e. buying the Nakamichi cassette deck, uh, the dual CS505 turntable, and any other in uh, input sources such as CD player and reel-to-reel -reel deck and the like. Now, I think that's still fairly true, but, the amplifier is the most important thing within a system because it's what gives you the sound. It's what feeds your loudspeakers uh, with the sound. And of course, it also takes the signals which your other peripherals are feeding into it and then doing something with those signals, whether they be analog or digital. And um, even for someone like me, who's not a technical person, but understands the theory behind a lot of this equipment, is that Super A amplification emerged in the late 80s, I'm sorry, late 70s and early 80s, as the sort of gold standard to amplification uh, within domestic hi-fi. And Class A amplification effectively reduced the amount of circuitry, uh, the amount of uh, cabling, and all that sort of excess um, of the transistor era, and in, in fact the valve era before it, and replaced it, replaced it with straight line amplification. And what straight line amplification effectively means is that you're reducing the components to a minimum. The components that you use within the amplification are that much better. So whether or not that be the capacitors, the transistors, or the diodes, are that much better and that much more advanced. Um, and by reducing all the wiring and the interconnects and all those other superfluous bits of, uh, of technology, effectively you get less hum and less distortion. So the amplifier itself performs far better. And I always used to think when listening to Class A amps versus the older style of amps, even tube amps or valve amps to a certain extent, is that they were incredibly clean and clear, that you could pretty much feed them with any digital or analog source, and the reproduction was pretty good um, uh, and as close, as close to the sort of musical truth um, that you could get in, in that era. Now, of course, there are some people out there who, who absolutely insist that valve amps give you the warmest sound. And the one behind me that you can see, which is about five years old, so it's a relatively new valve amp with Bluetooth and lots of other uh, modern additions, does give you a much warmer sound stage. And the best way I can describe it is that a good quality valve amplifier fed from a good quality analog source, such as a turntable, fed into good quality, uh, often British uh, loudspeakers, will give you some of the, the tonally the warmest sound possible. And I particularly like that amplifier and that setup for jazz and, uh, and very light classical music but its warmth doesn't really um, attune itself to vocals. And so I prefer a class A uh, digital or class A amplifier uh, for, for that sort of music and indeed for anything with, a, with a, an impressive bass track for argument's sake. So there's different types of amplifier. Amplifiers have grown over time and changed over time. But the one constant that seems to be in place is that Super A amplification or A-class amplification is still seen as a gold standard. So today we're going to talk about a early class A amplifier which was developed by JVC and I believe the components in the amplifier in the AX2 amplifier were actually developed by Matsushita Corporation. So some of the diodes and the caps that you'll see in the AX2 amplifier almost certainly would have been found in uh, Technics amplifiers or national uh, Panasonic uh, amplifiers of the day. So the AX2 was a mid-range amplifier 
at the time. And uh, the one thing that you'll notice about any JVC amplifier is that they always try to add extra features in because that's what JVC believed that users want wanted. Now, of course, in the UK, we became quite snobby about hi-fi for a time, which was very much underpinned by what was going on with NAD or the NAD Corporation in Germany by offering very clean, crisp, uh, bare hi-fi, um, which didn't have any additional bells or whistles and was very much sold as a, um, as a true product. Without uh, without any other distortions or other things that were brought in by flashing lights and LED indicators and the like, and the amplifier here, so the JVC amplifier, was very much part of that time when JVC was offering graphic equalizers on the amplifier and peak music displays. Marantz's PM310 and 350 were offering flashing LEDs and graphic equalizers, um, whilst NAD and the NAD3020 was offering a plain grey fronted box with only very small LED indicators. And they sold that on the back of being an audiophile standard amplifier. And whilst tonally, some people used to say that the NAD amplifiers were as close to a good quality tube or valve amp uh, that came before it, a lot of people liked something that they could adjust the tone quality themselves. And graphic equalizers at that time were, of course, incredibly popular. And whether or not they were built into your amplifier or receiver, or they were a separate box within the hi-fi, um, then amplifiers were particularly important. So the AX2 was a series of JVC Super A amplifiers, which were designed for the whole world market. Um, so in other words, they didn't have any tweaks that made them more appropriate to the British market or the European market. They were whole world products. So the AX2 in the US was identical to what was seen in the UK. And therefore we got what we were given. And unlike Sony at the time, and in, in fact, to the, almost to the present day, is there was no UK tuning of any of these products. So um, Hi-Fi did sound different depending on where you bought it. So a lot of Sony Hi-Fi separates were purposely tuned to the UK by reviewers who had UK ears, and then they replaced certain capacitors or other technology to attune them more to the UK market. And I always think that the best way of describing what the UK listened to compared to how, say, the US listened to it was by walking into a, a Tandy or a Radio Shack store back in the early 80s when you could walk in and you could be listening to a realistic um, amplifier or receiver through a pair of realistic speakers that were always sold singly, if you remember, um, and you would listen to that tone and it completely lacked any uh, high end response. So the top end frequencies were always uh, muted. The mid range was quite, uh, quite high and quite powerful. And the bass always sounded incredibly muffled. Now, I thought that that was just technical um, things, if you like, within the realistic equipment. But actually, that was the attuning that was given to a lot of US-based products, because the US had been used to pretty high technology items from RCA and the like, and they'd been listening to valve amplification much later um, than almost anywhere else in the world. So they wanted something that was tonally warm um, and would suit incredibly incredible sized living rooms, effectively. Whereas in the UK, with our smaller houses, we wanted something that was brighter, um, that was less muffled, uh, clearer sound, more akin, ironically, to a dancet come um, transistor radio, if you like, than the sort of muffled sound of a, of a valve amp. So that just gives you an idea of how the US markets and the US ears, if you like, differed to the UK ears. And so the JVC AX2 had to cater for all of those markets. And one of the ways that JVC and a lot of other brands got around that was by installing an SEA or sound effect amplifier graphic equalizer within the technology. So then you could pretty much adjust the sound stage to whatever you want and, uh, and and your room size. In reality, the graphic equalizer on the AX2, in the same way as many other items, uh, amplifiers at the time, was a simple 
base and treble control, a glorified base and treble control. Um, but it had a marked inf- a marked inf- marked effect on the sound quality and sound output. Um, also on the AX2 was the addition of a peak music power indicator or a flashing LED indicator, which suggested the uh, volume output or the peak volume output on the amplifier. Now, a bit like a a, a speedo on your bike or in the car, of course, the levels on there, the indicated levels on there, were always far higher than the rated output of the technology. And in this case, the AX2 actually has 35 watts per channel uh, into eight ohms, um, RMS. And as I remember to my uh, to my uh, horror in the past, that actually 35 watts per channel with 35 watts per channel speakers isn't a great match because actually the peak output can be closer to double or even triple that. Thus, if you were particularly into uh, house music and dance music as I was back in the day, you whopped your amplifier up, you popped it through a pair of uh, speakers that were more uh, adjusted to jazz or classical and you blow the bass driver straight away. And the AX2, um, I've done a bit of monitoring on this for the last uh, couple of weeks. And at full welly, absolutely 35 watts consistent is not a problem, uh, even through this amplifier, which is now what, 40 years old or thereabouts. Um, but the peak output is actually closer to around about 100 watts per channel when driven from a, a digital source, such as a CD player. So as you'll see, that the output is absolutely incredible. And as I say, for an amplifier of 40 years old, um, this thing still uh, still drives like a real beauty and is an absolutely superb amplifier, despite the fact that it was very much a mid-range player uh, in the day. So 1982, this was selling for about 249.99, and you'd be able to pick it up in uh, department stores and specialist hi-fi stores. But it was a bit of an underplayer, and I think it probably sold less than 5,000 items across the whole of the UK. So it wasn't one of the most popular uh, Super A amplifiers at the time. And admittedly, JVC was always seen as a mid-band player on uh, on hi-fi components. It was never a leader um, because people f- favoured others, such as Technics and NAD or, or NAD, as we said before. So in terms of an amplifier, it is incredibly well built. It's made in Japan and uh, and it's got all the settings, dials and inputs that you could ever need. Um, I personally think it sounds a lot better on uh, with a digital analog sound stage, so being fed by a CD player. Um, and I do find the phono input a little bit soft. And um, I've never been able to quite understand why, but I think maybe the phono stage technology in this amplifier really wasn't that good. Um, and therefore, the sound feels a bit thin. Um, and not particularly impactful compared to when being fed, even from a cassette. So I think it is the phono stage in here, uh, which wasn't particularly good. Something that really does date it is a five pin DIN input on the rear. Um, So that dates it in the very early part of the 1980s. So um, late 70s and early 80s, because by the mid 80s, certainly DIN had disappeared and RCA uh, were the order of the day. In fact, uh, JVC was introducing the AX911 and AX1010 amplifiers and receivers in 1988, which had optical and coaxial digital inputs. So they were well ahead of the market in that. Um, And considering that DIN had only gone, what, five years beforehand was a real leap in terms of uh, available technology. So... Really great amplifier. I think one of the things that everyone should note about any Class A amplifier is the fact that if you're putting 50Ps in your electric meter, then don't expect them to last too long if you're driving this hard. So on standby, this amp is going to consume 20 to 25 watts on standby alone um, or when it's not being fed by a source. But when you turn up that volume, then one of the problems with Class A amplifiers is that they consume a, a huge amount of electricity. And this thing, I think, is draining up to 400 watts at full tilt. Um, and that was one of the problems with Class A, that Class A needs a lot of power 
in um, and it also converts a lot of that power into heat so the heat sinks in this thing which i've replaced or had replaced recently get really quite warm to the touch during operation and that was one of the problems with class a that as i say you drive it hard the uh, amount of power it needs goes up uh, and it gets hot so it was a lot there's a lot of wasted energy in class a amplifiers something which digital class a amplifiers have prevented happening so they are they often have a, a lot uh, a lot less uh, requirements of power so this amp hungry on the power great power output particularly when driving into eight ohm speakers it can easily drive two sets of eight ohm uh, speakers without a problem and it's easily going to give you a peak output of 100 watts per channel so it definitely feels like an amplifier of its time it certainly has got a lot more life left in it and I personally think it makes a really good addition to pretty much any hi-fi system um, unless you're looking for something which is tonally less bright uh, you're looking for something a bit more uh, tubey a bit more valvey uh, and so that possibly wouldn't suit you too much so the AX2 amplifier, I'm regrettably uh, letting it go after spending a couple of years on it and cleaning it up and getting the heat sinks replaced and the caps replaced in there. Everything works perfectly, even the power meter. Uh, looks to me that it's uh, registering the cor correct sort of output. So um, I particularly like this amp. And what I'm planning on doing over the next few months is investing in some amplification on either side of class A. Um, so looking at um, class B amplification and also uh, class uh, super A. Um, and I've ordered a couple of items uh, that effectively ride just before it and just after it in terms of tech. And I'm gonna do a side-by-side -side comparison as to the sound outputs. And hopefully, if I can master my camera skills a little bit or my YouTube skills, I'm going to be able to demonstrate the different qualities of amplifier. And whilst you won't hear uh, the sound quality differences, what I'll hopefully be able to do is describe tonally um, the different types of quality available at around about 1975 to 1985, before digital amplifiers started coming in, uh, again, as I say, from JBC and Sony. So I hope you've liked this very brief video about uh, Super A amplification and particularly the AX2 amplifier. More than happy to answer any questions about it. Uh, you know where I am. You can contact me at uh, hi-fi at group365.co.uk or pop me a message uh, in the box below. Okay, take care and see you soon. Bye.